Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Julian Triggs, the President of the Australian Human Rights Commission, and it's a very, very great pleasure for me to welcome you all to this um, unique event, the attempt now to really understand the 30-year history of the Australian Human Rights Commission and to celebrate uh, 30 years um, of, uh, of work in human rights and anti-discrimination law. Um, we have so many distinguished guests, uh, but I would, if I may, may like to uh, recognise Claire Moore. Uh, Michael Kirby will be joining us if he can. Uh, Kate Eastman, uh, SC, I particularly wanted to recognise. She's been quite remarkable uh, with the Commission, providing us with pro bono legal advice for many years. She's been such a supporter of our work. Um, uh, can I recognise also Eva Cox? It's wonderful to see you here. Uh, but I'm sure I'm leaving people out, but you're all distinguished. We're absolutely delighted that you're with us. Uh, can I also recognise the commissioners with, uh, with the commission, Kate Jenkins, uh, a sex discrimination commissioner, uh, Kate Patterson, the um, age and disability, uh, oh, the age commissioner. Uh, I'm, we used to join them, but now uh, we don't. Uh, Kay is the age uh, uh, commissioner. And uh, Megan Mitchell also is with us, the first person to be appointed to uh, the post of children's Commissioner to produce her next report. Well, it's always a pleasure to see uh, you uh, at these offices here in, in the centre of the city. I, I love the fact that, that Pitt Street is just out there and that people come in off the street to talk to us about their concerns in relation to anti-discrimination law. Um, so I do acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, um, the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation, and I deeply respect their elders, past and present, and any who might be with us today. Um, well, our aim, our aim this evening is to take a reflective look back at the very rich history of the creation of the Commission, technically, in 1986. Uh, I'd like to, we want to celebrate our work uh, in supporting freedoms and the rights of all Australians. We're an A-status national human rights institution under the United Nations Paris principles. And Critical to those principles is the independence of the Commission from government. It's a curious uh, phenomenon. We're appointed by the government, we're paid for by the taxpayer, we report to Parliament, but we are independent. And that has been um, the, one of the most important elements of the work of the Commission. And in my view, reflects the commitment to the institutions of democracy. Um, perhaps it takes a brave government to have independent human rights bodies, but Australia has done, and it's done so uh, and been supported by governments for 30 years. And that's really what we're here to celebrate. Um, we, we have done a lot of work that we're proud of. Um, it's always a controversial environment to be in, at least in some areas. We have to take some knocks and some disappointments, but I think we've really uh, engaged in some really significant work. I just want to speak very, very briefly because we have some wonderful speakers today and I certainly don't want to take up any time, but something I do want to emphasise very positively is the work, uh, not only, of course, of the seven commissioners who have particular portfolios, but for the work of the staff of the commission uh, that is uh, not always understood, and that is the work on access to justice. Um, every year we receive about 20,000 inquiries from the public. Um, and they uh, or crystallise into about two and a half uh, or, or 2,200 uh, formal complaints a year. So across 30 years, we've probably dealt with about 65,000 formal complaints and hundreds of thousands of inquiries from the Australian public. This costs uh, complainants and respondents nothing, uh, and we do succeed in conciliating 74% of the matters that we attempt to conciliate here at the Commission. So I think it's an access to justice that I'm very proud of, uh, and I do uh, congratulate the staff of the Commission for carrying out this work. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's confidential. 
we can't talk about the cases in the public arena um, and and I really do want to salute that work but another area where I think we've been um, we have made a contribution that's been particular has been uh, the number of inquiries that we've run um, the first being uh, an inquiry into our homeless children in um, 1989 just three years after we were formally established by our legislation and since that time we've run a number of national inquiries on mental illness indigenous deaths in custody in, in 1996 a, a major um, a piece of work through the Commission uh, we've done work um, as early as 1997 on same-sex same entitlements um, a year a couple of years after that on pregnancy and work uh, we've done an inquiry into uh, immigration uh, detention of children in immigration in 2004 inquiries into employment and disability We've done one into uh, the treatment of individuals suspected of people smuggling, especially when they're children. And we've, of course, had our Forgotten Children's Report on children, again, held in immigration detention, and the Willing to Work Inquiry completed uh, by Susan Ryan on uh, employment discrimination against older Australians and Australians with disabilities. So I think those inquiries can push along at a systemic level some of the work that we've seen um, emerging from the uh, social justice complaints program that we run. Well, this evening is a special night because uh, it's the first of our events to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Commission. Uh, and uh, I hope some of them will be told tonight. Uh, you have a free license to, to do that. Um, uh, we will have three events, one being the one that you're very familiar with, I think, the Human Rights Awards we run every year. That will be held on the 9th of December. Um, next door at the Western Hotel and we recognize um, a leading Australian for the work that they've done in the community but we also have a number of categories uh, of people who have worked very very quietly often not known in the media but do excellent work and wonderful work in our communities for various aspects of human rights and anti-discrimination uh, law um, that will be an opportunity to talk about uh, the history of the Commission and uh, Quentin Bryce will be talking about it. She's a former sex discrimination uh, commissioner uh, and of course has gone on to be our Governor General and now continuing her work on violence against women in, in, uh, in Queensland. Uh, she's indefatigable but she's got a lot of good stories to tell and very happy to and will do so in a, in a major speech um, at, the, at that event. But these this evening and, and one other rights talk are designed um, for both a reflective evening, which is this evening, to look a little bit at the background and the history, uh, and the next one, I think a couple of weeks from now, uh, will be about the future work of the Commission, what we're doing now, where we're going after 30 years, where we want to take this extraordinary tradition uh, that's built on the work of so many people over 30 years. Well, we do have remarkable speakers tonight, um, and each of them has a long history of commitment to human rights, uh, and indeed have been friends to the Commission and worked with the Commission um, very quietly uh, and they've uh, done it without, um, without any particular reward other than the sheer pleasure of working with the Commission and achieving outcomes for human rights. Um, but they have really been remarkable people and we wanted both to honour them and to give them an opportunity to think um, a little bit about the past history of the Commission. Um, well, the first of, of our speakers and our keynote speaker um, is the Honourable Elizabeth Evert. Um, Elizabeth is very well known to you all, but I did think I'd mention one thing that she did that I think has been really seminal work. Uh, you'll all recall that um, she chaired the Royal Commission on Human Relationships in 1975, and in that she really revolutionised uh, family law and she gave it a new vision. And she said the purpose was a new purpose of applying the principles of fairness and justice to people undergoing the misfortune of a broken marriage. And, and in that role, uh, she really did lead to uh, significant amendments and recommendations on contraception, domestic violence, rape, abortion, child abuse, and discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation. And these issues remain um, vital issues for us to work with today. But I think Elizabeth's work has been extraordinary. Um, Elizabeth uh, has so many firsts, I, I, I won't go through them, but she was the first Chief Justice of the Family Court of Australia, uh, the first female judge of an Australian federal court, and the first female member of the Federal Conciliation and Arbitration Court. She was the first Australian to be elected, elected to the United Nations Human Rights Committee. Um, it's a real privilege for us to have her back in the Commission and to hear her thoughts about the 30-year history of the Commission. Please welcome Elizabeth.
Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respect to their elders, past and present. Um, Gillian Triggs has set the background for this evening and uh, I will give you some of my thoughts about the Commission over the years. When I was a member of the treaty bodies, CEDAW and the Human Rights Committee, our role was to cajole states to bring their laws, policies and practices into conformity with their treaty obligations. This commission has a comparable role to promote Australia's compliance with the human rights covenants and conventions it has accepted. And I want to talk about some of the challenges it's met along the way. The first human rights convention to come into force globally and the first to be ratified by Australia in 1975 was the International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, CERD. Its principles are enacted by the Racial Discrimination Act 1975. Despite successful multicultural policies, there's always been a strong undercurrent of racism and racial discrimination in Australia. It's permeated policies and attitudes towards our First Peoples for far too long and has been directed towards successive waves of migration. Combating racism and racial discrimination has been a mission of the Commission and the Race Discrimination Commissioner. Their work has generally been supported by government and the community, but there have been some areas of contention. In 1995, the President, Sir Ronald Wilson, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner, Mick Dodson, led the inquiry into the removal of Aboriginal children from their families. The Bringing Them Home report of 1997 concluded that there had been gross violations of human rights. It recommended reparations and apology and compensation. The government did not accept the findings of human rights violations, especially that of genocide. It refused to make an apology or to provide compensation. Controversy followed and frustration for those whose rights had been ignored for so long. The United Nations treaty bodies endorsed the Commission's findings of violation. Both CERD and the Human Rights Committee were critical of Australia's failure to provide compensation. It took more than 10 years for the national apology to be made in February 2008, though the states acted earlier. There has been mostly unsuccessful litigation by removal victims, which has well illustrated the lack of legal protection of human rights in our national laws. This was a hugely important inquiry. Despite its conclusions being unwelcome to the government, the Commission fulfilled its mandate by examining a dark part of our history in a human rights context and placing it on a po political and public agenda where it has remained and the stories are still being told. The Racial Discrimination Act played an important role in paving the way for the Mabo decision in 1992, which in turn led to the native title legislation. But following the High Court's decision in the Wick case of 1996, there were threats to both native title and the Racial Discrimination Act. Do you remember the call for bucket loads of extinguishment? Many of us thought the proposed amendments to the Native Title Act to deal with WIC were incompatible with the Racial Discrimination Act and CERD. Mick Dodson was at the forefront of efforts to prevent any derogation of rights and these efforts succeeded in ensuring that the legislation would be read and construed subject to the Racial Discrimination Act. This episode showed that the Act was not inviolable but would always need to be defended to ensure continued protection against racial discrimination. And after the Hindmarsh Island Bridge case, constitutional protection was uncertain at best. 
The Northern Territory emergency response in 2007 showed once again that the government was willing to exclude the operation of the Racial Discrimination Act in disregard of its obligations under CERD. The Commission raised many concerns about the discriminatory impact of the emergency legislation. The United Nations treaty bodies considered the measures to be inconsistent with our obligations under CERD and the Covenant. The offensive provisions were later withdrawn. Nevertheless, the story showed once again the lack of and the need for entrenched protection against discrimination. Section 18C was incorporated in the Race Discrimination Act in 1995 to cover actions which are likely to offend, insult, humiliate or intimidate a person or group of people because of their race, colour, national or ethnic origin and which cannot be justified under 18D. These provisions don't give full effect to Article 4A of CERD. Nevertheless, they've given rise to much heated controversy. The Commission understands well the impact of racial slurs on groups who do not occupy privileged positions and especially Aboriginal Australians who live with racism on a daily basis. Its work shows the importance of the protection which 18C gives. The cases it has dealt with under the provision show the difference between intentionally hurtful and trivial insults those falling within and those outside the scope of 18C. Significantly, nearly every complaint has been resolved without court action. Those who demand the freedom to offend and insult others on the basis of their race without any valid rationale cannot be taken seriously, especially in the current climate. The Commission has so far held the line on 18C but we can anticipate more storms ahead. Sex discrimination or anti-sex discrimination is more of a good news story here, though the happy ending is still some way off. While the Race Discrimination Act gives wide effect to CERD, the Sex Discrimination Act of 1984 does not even now fully implement the 1979 convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, CEDAW. The challenge for the Commission and the Sex Discrimination Commissioner has been to close that gap. A long time cause of shame for Australia was the lack of universal paid maternity leave entailing a reservation to CEDAW. The CEDAW committee uh, on which I served, incidentally, could never comprehend why Australia could not provide what nearly every other similar country had provided for women and families. For many years, the Sex Discrimination Commissioners, virtually all of them, battled for this important right for women and families until Australia's first national paid parental leave scheme was announced in 2010. Now, there have been some rather strange ups and downs since then and a current very unfair threat to erode the scheme. But it still stands today. <laughs> equal pay for work of equal value is a hugely important issue for women's economic security. Under the CEDAW and ILO conventions, Australia is obliged to ensure equal pay for work of equal value. Despite this commitment, the gender pay gap in Australia remains high, far too high. Women's savings and retirement incomes are only about half those of men. The CEDAW committee has urged Australia to adopt more effective mechanisms to eliminate the pay gap. The Sex Discrimination Commission have worked hard on this issue over the years. They've long argued that stronger legislation is needed new equal remuneration provisions based on the construction of undervaluation as opposed to discrimination. This is a work in progress. Sexual harassment was included in the Sex Discrimination Act early on and tackling it has always been an important part of the Commission's work. I'd like to commend 
the Commission for taking up also the issue of violence against women and family violence in keeping with the determination of the CEDAW Committee that gender-based violence is a form of discrimination against women and that states must take positive action to combat it. I don't need to elaborate on the high levels of violence against women in Australia and the unacceptable number of women who have been murdered by their partners. The Commission, through the Social Justice Commissioner, first took up family violence in 2006 in the context of Indigenous communities where it continues to be a very serious issue. Violence against women has become a priority in the Commission's work. The Sex Discrimination Commissioner has succeeded in making domestic and family violence a workplace issue through provisions about leave and flexible work arrangements. Uh, she, she has proposed legislation which would prohibit discrimination on the ground of domestic and family violence. Now, there have been many other positive moves by the Commission in regard to violence against women, and hopefully... These will continue to contribute to progress in this area. But there's one important issue where we still fall short of our commitments to implement CEDAW. The CEDAW committee has spotted this and has urged that the prohibition of discrimination against women and the principle of equality of women and men be entrenched in Australian law in line with convention requirements. Now, that's the happy ending that's worth working for. Turning to another issue, refugees. Article 9 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights provides that no one shall be subjected to arbitrary arrest or detention. The Commission has long taken the view in relation to asylum seekers that the long-term detention of unauthorised arrivals beyond any period needed for legitimate inquiries amounts to arbitrary detention in violation of Article 9. The Commission's opinion is fully in accord with that of the Human Rights Committee, the independent monitoring body for the Covenant, which has determined in numerous cases that prolonged detention of asylum seekers without review or justification is arbitrary and violation of Article 9. The original drafting records for the Covenant confirm this view. The Government does not accept either the Commission's opinion or the views of the Human Rights Committee on this issue, it continues to maintain that the lawfulness of detention is a matter for its own domestic law. Now, if this view were accepted, governments around the world would be free to enact extreme detention laws with the flimsiest of excuses and avoid any scrutiny under the Covenant, just as Australia claims to do. The introduction of offshore detention for asylum seekers and the removal of hundreds of men, women and children from our territory has raised new and serious human rights problems. The Commission's opinion is that Australia remains responsible for the protection of the human rights of those who have been removed and that their removal offshore and the conditions under which they are held puts their rights at risk. Children in offshore detention are at special risk. The Commission's report on the forgotten children revealed that the health and mental health of children had been harmed by long-term deprivation of li liberty. Health professionals said that children who'd spent several months on Nauru were amongst the most traumatised children they had ever seen. The Commission's view was that this treatment of children was incompatible with our treaty obligations. The Commission has raised many human rights issues in relation to the further hardening of migration legislation, which amazingly includes the elimination of the non-refoulement obligation in certain cases. These simply do not meet our international obligations. Now, the Commission's findings and recommendations on these issues are squarely based on our obligations under the international instruments and are in accord with the views expressed by independent expert United Nations bodies, such as the Human Rights Committee and the Committee Against Torture. They've made it clear that Australia is not released from its obligations by transferring people offshore, and that all asylum seekers must have the same protection, regardless of their mode or date of arrival. They've condemned the harsh treatment 
of asylum seekers in offshore detention. The situation is aggravated by the lack of access by any independent observers to assess the situation. Australia has failed to ratify the optional protocol to the Torture Convention, which requires detention facilities within Australia or within Australia's jurisdiction and control to be visited periodically by the United Nations Subcommittee on the Prevention of Torture. The evidence has continued to mount about the conditions of detention and the effects of prolonged deprivation of freedom on the mental and physical health of adults and children. Shocking allegations of abuse have led to a Senate inquiry into the treatment of asylum seekers and refugees on Nauru and Manus Island. The government denies that there are any adverse consequences or any actual or potential violations of human rights involved in the offshore program. It justifies the situation as a deterrent measure, thereby apparently conceding that this is a punishment regime, contrary to the Refugee Convention. In addition, it has attacked the Commission and mounted a personal attack on the present President, for daring to carry out the Commission's mandate of advising on human rights compliance and putting major human rights issues on the political and public agenda. That is its mandate. The Commission has put forward a human rights response to the issue of asylum seekers. It has urged the government to move quickly to bring asylum seekers to Australia and to work towards an effective regional cooperation framework and to seek solutions which are not solely based on deterrence. But this week's proposal to legislate to prevent any people in offshore detention from ever entering Australia is an inexplicable additional punishment on people who have fled persecution and have sought our help. That children are to be excluded from this ban hardly diminishes the likelihood of families being divided forever. How can that be acceptable? And when we consider the worldwide situation of asylum seeker, seekers, the millions who have fled to seek refuge outside their own countries, this vindictiveness towards a few hundred who have turned to us for help is impossible to understand. Summing up, the Commission has over 30 years carried out its mandate to uphold and promote the human rights protected by the covenants and conventions binding on Australia and to advise government when there are issues of concern. It has based itself firmly on its analysis of those obligations under international instruments. Its opinions are fully in accord with those of the relevant United Nations treaty bodies and international human rights lawyers. The government has not always accepted the Commission's findings and opinions. At times, it's been less than respectful in its responses to the Commission and the President. If the government has tried to silence the President, it has failed because the independence of the President and the Commission enables them to continue to speak truth to government, to advise when laws, policies or practices fall short of our human rights commitments. The independence, this independence, underpins the Commission's mandate. I've raised only a selection of issues where rights are in question. There remain other threats to our human rights which demand constant vigilance. To meet these challenges, we have an independent Commission and President, highly qualified, with the strength and the legal authority to speak out in defence of rights. Without these, we might never know how wide the gap is between our human rights aspirations and their fulfilment. We should value this and history will be on the side of the Commission. There is a postscript too which I hinted at earlier. Some of the difficulties I've mentioned would recede if we followed the example of other similar countries where the question whether rights have been violated or whether limits on human rights are justifiable is decided by courts. In Australia's case, the government has agreed to be bound by the covenant and other instruments, but it's not given its principles full legal effect. It should not be taken as criticism of the Commission or its opinion in human rights matters to suggest that we have come to a point where we should entrust these decisions 
to the judiciary by giving the provisions of the covenant full legal force and by moving on to the acceptance of entrenched constitutional rights, including, above all, uh, the right to equality and protection against discrimination. This would allow judicial insight into the compatibility of legislation with recognised rights and freedoms. Now, this event is to celebrate the 30 years of the Commission. Although I've used my time to raise difficult and controversial issues, I don't want to ignore the many positive achievements of the Commission in this period, the landmark reports, the successful advocacy, the new conventions added to its mandate on rights of children, those with disabilities, older people, bringing them new specialist commissioners. For 30 years, we've had an independent Human Rights Commission, a president and commissioners all actively promoting the protection of human rights and raising, sometimes loudly, their concerns about threats to those rights. I salute them and all their predecessors for their work, which taken together presents a clear and consistent vision of how we should achieve an Australia where human rights are enjoyed by everyone, everywhere, every day. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, that was um, no, scholarly and powerful in, in, in recognizing this um, phenomenon of the widening gap between our international obligations and the sophistication of international law on these issues and the parlous reality that in Australia we are moving backwards on so many of these issues. And if I perhaps can make one comment, um, I, I quite agree with you in relation to trusting the courts a little more, uh, hopefully with a Bill of Rights, entrenched or otherwise, but it's a phenomenon in Australia that we act politically, we, we are told not to trust our courts, that they will become activist courts, run amok, and they will, they will uh, simply overreach and create uh, new law. Now, there's nothing in the history of our Australian courts that suggests that for a moment, although, of course, some of you in this room will remember the remarkable court under Sir Anthony Mason and, of course, under Sir Gerard Brennan, where, of course, they were prepared to look at international law, including what some of you will remember is the Western Sahara case, which actually helped reach the decision in the Mabo decision and that led ultimately to recognition of native title. So we've seen so many positive results by looking intelligently uh, at international jurisprudence and international law. It's informed our growth as a nation. But the last 15 years in, in particular, we've seen this phenomenon of, of uh, uh, not looking at international jurisprudence and not trusting our courts. Well, we now have um, two wonderful speakers to provide some, some comments and their own view um, of, of the kind of issues that, uh, that Elizabeth has raised. And our first uh, uh, commentator is uh, Rosemary Kays. Rosemary is probably very well known to you all. She's been a human rights lawyer through her career. She's held ministerial advisory roles with the state and federal government on disability and carer issues. She was the external expert, expert on the Australian government delegation to the UN negotiations for the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. That's a very important um, experience and a very important contribution. And I love to talk about this in the international environment because, of course, Australia got there first. We produced this legislation um, and it then helped to form the basis for an international treaty. Usually it's the other way around for most countries and most circumstances, but here Australia really led the way. Another area that uh, perhaps even Kay can promote is, of course, that Australia Australia has age discrimination legislation before we have an international treaty. And let's see if um, over the years we can persuade the international community to look at this one as well. But I divert. Uh, Rosemary uh, served as the founding member of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade Disability uh, Reference Group, and perhaps above all from our point of view, has been a remarkable friend to the Human Rights Commission. Whenever we ask for her support in anything, along she comes. She's just marvellous. It's great to have her here. Please welcome her. I can't give you my seat. <laughs> That's my apologies. Thanks. 
Um, I'd like to thank the Commission for the invitation. Um, I am quite in awe of the colleagues that I've been um, asked to speak with and uh, it's quite an honour to be, to be asked to give a retrospective aspect to the disability um, work that the Commission has done. Uh, but I would like to note that we haven't been around for 30 years within the Commission and that's some of the stuff that I will talk about. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the uh, Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I like to believe that the elders, both past and present, would believe that our topics and our conversations tonight are important and powerful and um, are deserving of, of of being on their land. I suppose what I want to start with, and I just want to speak briefly in, in four, four, four core areas about disability and the work of the Convention. I want to talk about the Commission and its um, recognition of disability. I then want to talk about the statutory and the somewhat loose regulatory framework around disability that we have. And then I want to talk about broader human rights protections and draw it to a close looking a little bit forward. I know we're supposed to be retrospective, but I thought I'd like to look a little bit forward about looking at the role for the Commission in terms of diversity and inter intersectionality. You will have noted um, when Elizabeth was speaking that disability was mentioned as a, a convention that came to the UN system after um, many years of development of the other treaties. And disability was late to the Commission as well. The DDA was promulgated in 1992 and the Commission played a significant role in getting that piece of legislation together. Um, taken by the um, momentum of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Members of the Commission, Brian Burdekin in particular, David Mason and Kieran Fitzpatrick drove work around getting a Disability Discrimination Act up and through Parliament. It was kind of amazing that they were able to get it together in the time frame that they did and get it passed through um, what everybody believed was going to be the dying days of the Keating government. Um, that government didn't actually lose power, but the DDA was enshrined. But even before the DDA, the Commission gave recognition to people with disability. For people with disability, recognition within human rights at this stage was as other status. It wasn't that the UN didn't have a focus on disability, disability figured in the jurisprudence, disability figured in the programmatic work, it figured, figured in the non-binding declarations of 1971 and 1975. But formally through the binding international instruments, the two covenants, people with disability were recognised as under other status and that's how people with disability were able to claim their rights. And even before we had the DDA here in Australia, we had a disability commissioner, or we had a commissioner, human rights commissioner, who was a person with a disability. And that was incredibly groundbreaking. That was the appointment of somebody, Elizabeth had a um, physical disability, but it was a very symbolic appointment for people with disability. And that is one of the strengths of the Commission is the way that it is given recognition to people with disability. Not just in the appointment of the commissioners, but it's been important that the bulk of the time that there has been a commissioner for people with disability, it has been a person with the lived experience of disability. Um, and they carry that tradition with the appointment of the latest commissioner, Alistair McEwen. But fundamentally, the Commission has also worked very, very hard to give voice to the disability community. The disability community, both figuratively and literally, does not often have a voice. It has been silent in the areas of public policy for many years due to historic discrimination 
and through historic discrimination that is based around education and access to employment, there weren't many voices of people with disability at policy tables. Within government, both federally and state, there was a lack of voice. And that was something that the Commission was able to do. It was able to give space and fora and brought people with disability into that space as experts and respected their role as experts. Now, we can argue that they may not always have got it right in terms of consultation and bringing people with disability on board, but overall, the respect has been there and the engagement has been there. And that recognition has been significant in fostering the participation of people with disability more broadly within the human rights context. And that is incredibly important when you think about some of the statutory and regulatory processes that the Commission has had to deal with in the area of disability, especially around the standards. And I will talk about that in a moment. The other thing I want to talk about is the, the statutory and the regulatory framework of Australia in relation to disability is very much focused on an individual complaint system. It's an individual complaint system where people with disability have to claim their own rights. Their rights are not accorded, it's not systemically structured, and they're not completely respected. There is a piece, piecemeal approach across the, human, the regulatory framework and our human rights are something that the onus is on us to claim. Now, <laughs> for my sins, I teach discrimination law at university and uh, one of my favourite favorite quotes that I will give my students when we first start discrimination law is the quote from Michael Kirby in the case of Amory in New South Wales, where Michael Kirby laments that discrimination law is um, littered with the bodies of the wounded. Now, in the area of discrimination law, nothing could be further from the truth. We come to this day and it is still extremely difficult for people with disability to be able to negotiate the individual complaint system, given the adversarial nature, but also given the way that, as Gillian was indicating and Elizabeth was indicating, our courts, under the guise of being non-activists, become very narrowing in terms of their interpretation of the law. So a broad and purposive response to legislation has been left behind for narrow interpretations so the court isn't seen and can be labelled an activist court. The alternative to that is what was strived by the authors of the DDA was to balance the individual complaints mechanism with systemic mechanisms within the DDA. And the Commission has been central in driving these systemic responses. The disability standards were seen as a way of getting systemic, systemic address so people with disability weren't um, driven to claim their own rights, but the failure to include any licensing, any co-regulation co is something that we can look back on the standards process and say there is a missed opportunity. The same can go for the other mechanisms that can be seen as systemic responses, but essentially still get caught hung up in the individual, individual complaints um, structure. The exemptions. The exemptions try and do, within a poor statutory framework, what the standards should be doing. In an industry or a modal-based area, 
giving clarity and a time frame for which sectors can work towards compliance. But this nuanced use of exemptions is not always understood by the sector and many people just see it as giving people carte blanche to discriminate. Our use of inquiries is trying to take the burden off people with disability by identifying areas where we need big systemic problem solving to areas such as employment. I don't know whether we've needed exactly four inquiries into employment, but you know, systemic responses are always held to ransom by resources. And it's fine for me to sit up here and say we could have done, you know, maybe a little bit less on employment and a little bit more on other things is fine, but the Commission has to have the resources, both human and financial, to be able to do that. But what are the triggers for inquiries? The triggers for inquiries should be about recognising those vulnerable areas where people place individual claims that are open to reasonable accommodation, that are tricky in terms of being able to argue that in an adversarial structure, that, that, that needs a much more nuanced, focused, problem-solving approach. Things like captioning. Things like the airlines, you know, the transport standards give you so much, but it is a broad, all-encompassing set of standards. It's not nuanced enough for the airlines. Would an inquiry have argued better the Jetstar case? Would we have had a 60-year-old um, year disability pensioner slugged with a $20,000 adverse cost order and an adverse decision? in the case of the airlines, who knows? But I think that was an area where reasonable accommodation was always reasonable adjustment, sorry, international law jargon slipping back in, my apologies. Reasonable adjustments was always gonna be a vulnerability. To broader human rights, out, the mechanisms outside the DDA, like other areas, we don't we approach the coverage in a very piecemeal way. The coverage that we have is inconsistent in saying that we are compliant by res respecting and protecting all human rights and fundamental freedoms of people with disability. What happens is areas such as care treatment and protection are left because there sometimes isn't remedies and the people that experience the most significant human rights violations are vulnerable to the point where they can't utilise the individual complaints process. And that the problem solving mechanism that the Commission has is left with a parliamentary report. Now, the difficulty is that we're not moving on the core, core issues of some of the most egregious human rights violations. People with disability are three times more likely to be subject to violence, both domestically and institutionally. It carries both a gender perspective and a disability perspective. People with cognitive disabilities are three to nine times more likely to be incarcerated. Those people are also vulnerable to be incarcerated indefinitely. Their status as administrative detainees is, I would say, arbitrary and not in compliance with our human rights obligations. The response that we've got and the tools that the Commission have are not strong enough to address something when you have something like the report that the Commission gave on indefinite detention for people with cognitive disability and the response you get back is it's a state and territory problem. Yes, it's a state and territory problem, but the federal government has the obligation. So I query the ability of the, the Commission to be able to move into things like COAG, to be able to have the entree and engagement 
that needs to bring the power to that treaty process and that's what COAG, the Council of Australian Governments, was established for, to be able to deal with the overarching treaty obligations and uh, treaty negotiations. The same with other areas that are emerging, such as the NDIS. Now, the NDIS is a significant change, but the real driver for the NDIS is going to be the National Disability Strategy. And nobody, nobody is talking about that. The National Disability Insurance Scheme strength is that it's an insurance model. The National Disability Insurance Scheme's weakness is that it's an insurance model. Without driving the National Disability Strategy, we will not develop access in mainstream Australia to take pressure off the need for disability supports. The NDIS is at risk of financially blowing out and losing the potential of strong <coughs> voice choice and control for people with disability. And lastly, and I'm, I will be brief, diversity and intersectionality. There's an inherent silo effect given the nature of our um, character-based legislation. It's made, very, made it very difficult to develop good whole of government cross portfolio interdisciplinary responses to areas. I've been working very hard with um, colleagues from the sector on the trying to get traction around violence of women with disability into the third national action plan on violence against women. Now this is something that we should be driving through the commission because it's got traction and it's got space in that negotiation. And this is where we need to be able to pick it up. We need to move beyond the silos of character, um, of character based legislation and recognise that disability, race, sex, gender, age are all indivisible. Like our human rights, they are indivisible and universal. And I think the challenge for the Commission then is how we deal with intersectionality and truly embrace a, a diversity agenda for the Commission for the next 30 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Rosemary, and, and, and for your, your thoughts, not only uh, reflective on the past and what we've been achieving, but where you see we really need to go. And that, that will give us a lot to think about in terms of diversity. I think you make the very important point about our inquiries. The advantage of inquiry is that you can get solid, accurate research that can inform policy making, or you hope it will. Uh, we know very well here at the Commission that speaking um, from aspirations, from anecdotes, is, is, is in fact dangerous. We must ensure that everything we do uh, is based in good research and that then hopefully can drive policy. Uh, thank you very much. And now we come to um, uh, Chris Sedoti, um, who again has been um, a long-term friend of, of the uh, commissioner. Uh, he, uh, he's a human rights lawyer, he's an activist and he's a teacher. Um, he was um, the Australian Law Reform Commissioner uh, in the early 90s, and in 1995 became Australia's Human Rights Commissioner. I don't know there's anybody with a longer uh, and, and more comprehensive understanding of the, of the Commission uh, than, than Chris. Um, he uh, works now as a, um, an international human rights consultant. He specialises in the human rights system and international institutions uh, across the world, particularly the Asia-Pacific. He's a director and a board member of the International Service for Human Rights based in Geneva. Um, and he really has been um, one, of the, one of the most um, thoughtful and committed uh, uh, friends to the Commission, uh, even in the years after he was Human Rights Commissioner. So please welcome Chris. Thanks, Gillian. Um, I too honour the elders of the Gadigal people and indeed all the elders of the Aora Nation tonight. I'm glad I'm speaking last. 
Elizabeth and Rosemary have been inspirational, talking about human rights issues and human rights institutions. I'm going to talk about human rights politics. Brave man. It's important to remember history. This commission, whose 30th anniversary we celebrate on the 10th of December next month, was not the first human rights commission in Australia. Um, it had a predecessor established 35 years ago in 1981. That predecessor was the result of political compromise. During the 1970s, the Whitlam government had attempted to introduce a Bill of Rights and had quite spectacularly failed. But there was the commencement of ratification of international treaties that Elizabeth referred to. And they raised the question for Australia of how we were going to perform our obligations under those treaties if we didn't have a Bill of Rights. In the absence of a Bill of Rights, the Fraser government decided in 1981 to establish a Human Rights Commission that should be responsible for monitoring the performance of international human rights obligations. That first commission was led by Dame Roma Mitchell, uh, one of the, the torchbearers for women in Australia, and particularly women in the law, and a great chairperson in those days, not president, of that first commission. According to the legislative flavour of the times, the commission had a sunset clause in its legislation. Uh, much legislation then was meant to expire after a particular period. And in this case, the sunset clause provided for a five-year demise, 9th of December 1986. During the years before that, there had been again attempts to enact a Bill of Rights for Australia, and those attempts too had failed. And in the end, as late 1986 drew near, again, the approach of having a Human Rights Commission to take responsibility for international law was seized upon then by the Labor government uh, as the next best alternative to having a proper statutory Bill of Rights. They, in fact, came across the, the new idea of actually annexing to the legislation some of the key international treaties. So at least they had some form of quasi-legislative endorsement. But even doing that was controversial. The then opposition opposed this tooth and nail throughout the latter part of 1986, so much so that the establishment of this commission was very much an 11th hour success. The legislation didn't pass until the 28th of November in the Senate and the 3rd of December in the House of Representatives. And it was assented to on the 6th of December and the first commission disappeared on the 9th and this commission began on the 10th. Nonetheless, the battle over the commission wasn't quite over. In 1987, the following year, the Howard-led opposition went into the election with a policy of abolishing the then recently established commission. And the Peacock-led opposition did exactly the same in the election of 1990. The change of mind by the coalition parties only resulted from more liberal leadership under John Hewson, so that in 1993, the coalition parties committed to the continuation of the commission, and that was carried forward to 1996. Continuation, but with reduced resources and hopefully reduced powers. The commission then started its work at the end of 1986. It wasn't long before it ran into trouble with the then Labor government that had established it. There were a number of TIFFs during those first couple of years, but the first big one was in the 1990 debate about a proposed Australia card. Um, this was a proposal to establish an identity card for all Australians, something which in this country we have never had and still don't have. The government was firmly committed to it at the time, and the Commission gave the advice that the enactment of legislation for an Australia card would be a violation of international human rights obligations. 
That advice was not well received. Um, the then Human Rights Commissioner, Brian Burdekin, was confronted by the responsible minister and invited to resign. <laughs> the Australia card was not adopted, and instead we got a Privacy Act. The question of discrimination was there right from the beginning, and the question of whose benefit anti-discrimination law existed to protect. Soon after the Australia card debate, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner was in the firing line, Quentin Bryce. She received a complaint that women's health services violated the Sex Discrimination Act. And when she rejected that complaint, on the basis that women's health services represented a special measure for women, reflecting the disadvantage that they experienced in health, when she came to that decision, she was roundly vilified in the News Limited media. The vilification of Quentin worsened when some private comments she had made about the nature of these kinds of complaints found their way into the public domain through freedom of information legislation. Uh, and then it was really on, calling, demanding her resignation. Quentin seems to have survived that particular scandal. <laughs> Two years after that, Brian Burdekin completed his national inquiry into mental illness. Yeah. This was the third national inquiry undertaken by the Human Rights Commission. And uh, Julian has referred, oh, she moved back there. Julian has referred to the others that were undertaken since then. Um, I might just reflect in passing that the, the process of national inquiries undertaken by this commission has been one of the most successful processes that we have had here in this country and indeed has been emulated now throughout the Asia Pacific region. So this is something that was groundbreaking in terms of human rights investigations and processes and it's had significant results outside this, this country. But Brian's inquiry into mental illness was not quite so well received at all times. Uh, after his report was released in 1994, um, a cabinet minister in the then Labor government um, suggested to him that he should take arsenic. I became Human Rights Commissioner in August 1995. And one of the first responsibilities I had was to handle complaints dealing with asylum seekers. I mean, I thought at the time, the more things changed, the more they stayed the same. Um, I had previously been the first secretary of the Human Rights Commission. And in August 1989, I had made a visit to the first detention centre in a scout camp outside Darwin, where the first boatload of asylum seekers were being detained. And the Commission began talking in August 1989 about the treatment of asylum seekers. When I returned as Human Rights Commissioner in 1995, this was still an issue. When handling this complaint, I sought some documents from the government. And the government declined to provide them. This came as something as a shock because the processes of the Commission before then had been respected by government departments and ministers. Because the request for documents was declined, um, I issued an order for their production under the legislation. And the order was rejected. Because of the significance of this decision by a federal minister, uh, a Labor minister, I made the decision to commence action in the courts for a writ of mandamus to enforce the order that had been issued by the Commission. The Minister was not impressed and decided to, to fight the application to the courts, but to do so in a way that really took us by surprise. Um, I, I would have thought, we did think at the time, there wasn't much legal basis for an order of the Commission issued under the legislation to be challenged. 
Um, but as, as it happens, the challenge was made on the basis that I had acted in bad faith. And um, I recall the senior counsel representing the government at the time, David Bennett, um, later the Solicitor General, uh, in cross-examining me in that particular case, commencing this part of the cross-examination by saying, I would like to state before I commence that I am undertaking the following cross-examination on explicit instructions from my client. <laughs> um, lawyers amongst you will understand what that means. After the government changed in March 1996, not much else changed. Soon after the government changed, the then Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Sue Walpole, who had been very active in relation to equal pay. I mean, this was a particular issue for Sue during her years at the Commission. Um, she was described by the then Prime Minister, John Howard, in Parliament um, as a Labor Party stooge. But that was nothing compared to what was to come when the Bringing Them Home report was released in 1997. Again, this was the product of another of these national inquiry processes from the Commission. I still look back on that report, 30 years into the life of the Commission, as the single most important thing that this Commission has ever undertaken. And it was huge process, the biggest thing that the Commission has undertaken, perhaps with the exception of the ADF work that Liz, that, um, Liz Broderick did. It was a very big exercise and it was very significant. It produced a report that set out this history, this part of our national history, the history of the stolen generations. The most controversial part of the report, without doubt, was the conclusion that the Commission came to that these policies constituted genocide. The Commission's president at that time was Ron Wilson. Uh, Ron had been a High Court judge during the 1990s and had distinguished himself throughout that period by being one of the two dissenters to almost all the major decisions of the Mason Court that Elizabeth praised. Ron was a truly black letter lawyer and an extremely conservative judge. And at the end of the Bringing Them Home inquiry, Ron said, I never expected that we would come to a conclusion that these policies constituted genocide. But after taking the evidence and considering the law, I have no alternative but to come to that conclusion. You know, this from the great dissenter of the 1980s. But I think that there was no part of that whole process that so enraged the then Prime Minister than that particular conclusion. First, the tabling of the report was delayed until literally the last possible day under the legislation. Second, the tabling of the report was preceded by its leaking to News Limited newspapers. Under the rules of parliamentary privilege, the Commission was precluded from commenting on any of its reports that needed to be tabled until such time as the tabling had occurred. And we respected those rules and said nothing, while for a week, the Australian ran day after day with the material in that report. And of course, Ron Wilson's resignation was demanded. The Commission's budget in 1997, um, three months after the tabling of the Stolen Generations report, was cut by 40%. Um, at Christmas that year, 30% of, of the Commission's staff were terminated. Between 1997 and 2000, there were three attempts to amend the Commission's legislation to restructure the Commission by replacing the specialist commissioners of sex discrimination, race discrimination and so forth with generalist commissioners. One part of this legislation was to effect a spill of all existing commissioner office holders so that there would be a complete clearing of the decks. 
That aspect of the legislation was rejected on three occasions between 1997 and 2000 by the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee, chaired by Senator Maurice Payne. And the legislation was not therefore pressed in the Senate because of opposition from that committee. The legislation that was finally passed was passed in 2000. By then, it, it wasn't really necessary to spill all the commissioner positions. Um, I was the last appointed by the previous government and my time was up in August 2000 and the rest had gone before me. So the legislation in, in 2000 did not affect the changes that had been sought earlier to bring in generalist commissioners and did not spill existing commissions, commissioners. And that's good. What it did do, interestingly enough, was to transfer complaint handling powers from the individual commissioners to the president of the commission. Before this, each specialist commissioner was responsible for complaints within her or his piece of legislation. So as I said, Quentin Bryce, a sex discrimination commissioner, dealt with the sex discrimination complaints. The legislation transferred that to the president of the commission. And interestingly, the reason given for that was that it would free the individual portfolio commissioners from any potential conflict of interest in being advocates for the legislation and having to deal with complaints. I, 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 thought, about, I thought about this recently in relation to Tim, Sut, well, I can never pronounce it, Sutpamansen's comments um, about racist media and cartoons and how he was criticised because the Commission might be taking these complaints. And I thought, well, that's precisely what John Howard's government wanted him to do. Precisely. And in fact, the commissioners have the power to intervene in court proceedings under the legislation as friends of the court. So it seemed to me that what the present Race Discrimination Commissioner was doing was no more than what the government in 2000 wanted him to do. Look, I'm out of time and I'm only halfway through the history, so I'll go to the end. <laughs> when I look back over 30 years, I draw five conclusions. First, the fundamental test of whether a national human rights institution is doing its job is whether there is tension in its relationship with government. That tension is not an aberration. It should be the normal course of events. And if it's not, we are entitled to challenge the Commission. Second, no government, and by that I mean no political party, is relaxed about criticism of its human rights performance. And so the tension will be there no matter who is in government. Human rights work is nonpartisan precisely because all governments will not be happy about an institution that does it effectively. Third, however, I gotta say, in Australia, the conservative parties are especially bad at accepting the legitimacy of human rights members, commission members, who are appointed by their predecessors. That's a fact of life. They'll calm down once they make all the appointments. It won't get good, but at least it'll be less bad. Fourth, in spite of 30 years of political pressure, not a single member of this commission has resigned because of it. The strength and independence of the commission today has its basis in the fact that for 30 years, not a single member has resigned under political pressure. And if the Commission is to retain the independence that Elizabeth has described as its core attribute into the future, not a single member must resign due to political pressure. 
end of story. And those who think that they can secure that objective need to think again. And fifth, human rights work has a cost. We need to remember that for us, in this country, the cost is relatively small. We're not really in danger of losing our lives, although human rights commissioners in the past have received death threats, but we're not fundamentally at risk of that or of false imprisonment. Um, we can be vilified, but who cares? Um, people can lose their jobs, that's serious, and people have lost their jobs because of the work of human rights in this institution. It has happened. Human rights work has a cost, and we need to remember the cost and the toll that it takes on the people that are doing it. And those who are paying the price need the support of those who are not paying so much. Five things. I, I really, I, I've really liked over these last few years, you know, the, the Obamas proclaiming that their family motto, when they go low, we go high. It's really, really nice. The Human Rights Commission has got it wrong on occasions. It's, it's a human institution made up of human beings, hasn't done the right thing all the time, formed some wrong conclusions. Yeah, that's right. But over the course of the 30 years when I look back on it, I, I'm, I'm happy to draw the conclusion that when they've gone low, it's gone high. And may it ever be so. Thank you, Chris. That was really an outstanding um, presentation. I think we could have listened for a lot longer to get to that full history, and I hope you'll publish it and, and let us have it. It's really remarkable. Um, uh, of course, things are, are difficult. Uh, uh, I listen to you with some despair in my heart, uh, but you've also made my day. Um, I haven't yet been offered arsenic. So. <laughs> And when you say we do have to think a little bit about what's happening in Australia, uh, there are pockets of egregious breaches of human rights, and Elizabeth has really addressed those. But for the most part, for most Australians, their concerns are actually employment, fair access to housing, uh, they're those kinds of issues. And I'm rather reminded of an interview I saw with the um, remarkably robust now Clive James, who said, well, it's not the siege of Stalingrad. We have to put things into some kind of perspective. Um, and for us, it's pockets of egregious harm, indigenous incarceration, uh, violence against women, asylum seeker policies that are simply getting worse by the minute rather than better. These are, of course, a deeply egregious matters. Uh, but for most Australians, frankly, uh, it is about employment and delivery of goods and services on the basis of equality and non-discrimination. And that really is, in fact, where the Commission is going in some of its work over the next year or so, but we'll hear more of that later. Uh, so thank you. That's really a remarkable uh, array of issues that have been discussed that give some sense of flavour of the kind of work that the Commission has been involved in for 30 years. So now it's over to you. Let's see what questions or comments you might have. And could you please um, say who you are? It's always interesting for us. Uh, keep your comments or questions brief so that uh, as many people can uh, can be engaged in this as possible. Uh, one, two, and three. That gets to us. Uh, hello. Um, first of all, thank you to all the speakers. I thought you spoke magnificently. Um, uh, Edwin Nelson, um, I've recently graduated from Macquarie University and I'm just at the College of Law now. Um, my question to the panel is this. Um, Many people who are ordinary people, it's very unnatural to go out of their ordinary lives and want to make a, make a complaint to the Human Rights Commission. Um, it's not things that people would do naturally. Um, so my question is, how do you facilitate a way whereby a lot of people who suffer from disadvantage have the capacity to actually access 
the resources of the Commission. Um, and I'll give particular references to things like the thing that came out on Four Corners with people being uh, children in custody and, and being abused there, um, uh, people in official capacities. You know, it's, it's not a natural thing to do. How do you facilitate that and how do you create a mechanism whereby ordinary people see this as being a, a, a thing to um, apply to? Thank you for reminding me of so much of the history that I've begun to forget and to remind us that, you know, that every president, in a sense, everybody gets criticised and keep up the good work. I want you to raise an issue which I think is coming up as an issue and I would like it just to be sort of considered. And it comes up as part of Indigenous stuff, it comes up as part of poverty and inequality and various other things. And it's a shift that's happened, particularly around women's stuff and other things, which is that we fought furiously for the right to have a paid job. Now we seem to be caught up with the obligation to have a paid job or else you get punished by the government. And what I'd like the Human Rights Commission to do is to look at ways that we can actually move back to the idea that there are many ways to contribute to good societies and not all of them involve paid work. And therefore we need to look at it, you're getting it with the paid parental leave, you're getting it with the excuses and justifications for disability services, you're getting it in so many areas where the only justification is increasing gross domestic product. And I think we need to get back to the idea that society gets contributed to in many ways and that the right to contribute in non-economic ways has to also stay on the agenda but make sure it doesn't become an obligation. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Gauri Gupta and Divya and I are high school teachers at Loreto Nomenhurst and at Loreto Nomenhurst and we teach legal studies and human rights is one of our topics and in today's HSE exam there was the question of charter of rights and whether or not Australia should have a charter of rights so as I would just like you all to share your wisdom as to how should we educate the current generation to stand up for human rights because that's one thing that we have noticed that the current generation does stand for equality and does stand for human rights and how could we guide them to get rid of all the social stigmas and the prejudices that arise especially regarding refugees asylum seekers and racism as well thank you oh yes i think it does yes <laughs> oh well um the the, the first uh, question um getting access to the commission well there are many many ways to do that i think maybe chris might have something more to say about the practicalities of getting in touch with the commission but uh, from my point of view i thought it was fairly easy actually to access the commission so from their website uh, there's lots of ways uh, eva's question <laughs> raises some very very uh, important issues uh, which I, I i can't find a ready response either except to say of course in in family law we value we value the un unpaid if you want to call it the work of homemakers and carers is valued in the family law sense um, how to make it valued in the economic life of the country I'm not sure it's not included in the GDP is that what you're aiming at but that doesn't really help the individual now as to teaching human rights of course the first thing is to tell your students what human rights are starting with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and there are many uh, teaching um, instruments available for this which show what each human right is and what it means to an individual and how it can be threatened and how you need to protect it i'm sure there are teaching materials i'm sure the commission here can give pointers to where to find those yes so, do you want to, did you want to um i i'm still on um i suppose in relation to the first question, 
I'd like to give a bit of a shout out for the community legal centres that we have in Australia. Um, community legal centres, the disability discrimination legal services that were established as part of the implementation of the DTA um, provide a critical service in giving access to people with disability to um, the Commission and the individual complaints process, but also a few of them now have human rights practices for complaints under the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. That um, doesn't mean that they're not fraught with the political tensions that um, apply to the Commission as well. I mean, the amount of funds that have been taken out of community legal centres, the drive to keep them as just just organisations that do phone advice after phone advice after phone advice and please don't do anything complex like take a case to court. And please don't, you know, take it to the high court. That's just not what we want. We don't want to test the law. We just want to be able to say our community legal centres give free advice to thousands and thousands of vulnerable people. Aren't we fabulous? We don't do any real legal work because we haven't got the resources. Um, I mean, that's that's me being incredibly irritable <laughs> because community legal centres with the smell of an oily rag that they work on do do lots of work and they are a, a great source of access for people um, both with disability and without disability that want to access the um, complaints mechanisms that are available. Eva, um, the luxury of being respected for the work that you do outside the economic life of the community. Um, people with disability find that voluntary work is generally the only option that they have available to try and get experience, to try and break into open employment. Um, just my own experience, you know, Everything I've done in terms of the human rights work, all the stuff I did around the convention, all the stuff I've done around the Shadow Report, the UPR, every single moment of that was unpaid. And that's not trying to get some accolade for me. It's about recognising that people with disability in their career trajectory is very, very fragile. And so getting... Um, some form of recognition for the humongous amount of voluntary work that people with disability do and yet it's not recognised in the welfare reforms is really, really quite frustrating. So yes, I understand completely. And being a human rights teacher, um, yeah, there are, there are lots and lots of resources um, and the struggle for, for us is that we live in a country where kids don't learn the constitution. Why would you want to learn our constitution? It's a technical mechanism by how, by which governs what the states do and what the feds do. And they continually argue about who should be doing it when and devolve it to the states and then devolve it back to the feds and then devolve it down to the states again. It's a fabulous little pendulum. But yeah, um, the Canadians were able to get a statutory bill of rights and turn it into constitution. I live in hope. <laughs> well done. Right. Chris. And so do I. <laughs> um, I. I'd like to approach the three questions together because to me they all raise a common issue of knowledge and understanding. Now, the Commission's processes, Edwin, are pretty good, but people actually, many people, those who need them most, often are not aware of them. Um, you know, recognition either of right to work and obligation to work is part of the process, as Rosemary said. Um, the problem is that, that literacy about human rights in this country is low. And I think one of the reasons for that is that the vast majority of Australians, generally speaking, do not experience extreme human rights violations relative to countries around us. Aboriginal people, yes. Asylum seekers, yes. When you talk about Indigenous people and asylum seekers, you are talking about human rights situations on a par with the worst in the world. I, I don't think that not as bad as asylum seekers. Well, anyway, I'm not going to. It's, it's silly. It's a silly argument. I'm sorry, Rosemary. I shouldn't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
we won't enter into the arguments of competing disadvantage. But, but my, my concern is that, that most people do not interpret their experiences in human rights terms. They see it as unfair or not nice or even someone being nasty because we don't have the literacy about human rights to, to know that what's happening to us is a human rights issue. And, and secondly, they don't then generally, and I hate generalisations, but I use them, the majority of the population doesn't allocate enough priority to human rights. Now, when we had the consultation on human rights protection in Australia, it elicited amongst the, the highest number of responses of any consultation on any subject in this country, and they were overwhelmingly, by which I mean I forget, 85, 90% in favour of a Bill of Rights. But do those people allocate so much importance to that that they will, for example, vote in favour of a Bill of Rights? Not that there's any choice because both parties are equally bad on the subject. But, but would they? Would they demand it? You know, is it the most important thing in their minds? Generally not. So we need to increase literacy, knowledge and understanding so that the importance that is attached to human rights protection is raised in this country from where it is at the moment. Um, yeah, I, and in fact, I, I, I do heartily agree with wrapping this up in the idea of education. And it's wonderful to have two teachers here. And one thing we are doing is working next year with the deeds of the schools of education in the university to integrate human rights training as part of teachers' training, which will get it out. And that this is, I, we see this as a core problem. Uh, you speak to an American 10 year old, they know what the First Amendment is, they can tell you, uh, you know, the Fifth Amendment. Uh, ask an Australian any question about the Constitution, absolutely no idea at all. So um, that, is, that is a core problem, and that is why we need everything we do here at the Commission comes back to the need for education. But we do have a great website too, so perhaps you, we can talk to you later, but we've got some fantastic resources on our website. Yes, now some further questions. One, uh, uh, one, two, and then uh, the lady over there, uh, three, so yes. Yes. Thank you. My name is Neville Roach. I used to be the chairman of the Council for Multicultural Australia and the Business Migration Advisory Panel. I resigned both positions in 2002 in protest of the treatment of asylum seekers. At the time, I was very confident that we would win if there was a change of government, and we did. Uh, the asylum seeker policy was reversed almost entirely uh, under Kevin Rudd to start with. And uh, a whole lot of other things. The apology took place as we had hoped it would. And, but of course, that only lasted for a short time. And since then, we've been going steadily. I mean, maybe it's my age that makes me worse and worse, as someone said, by the minute in, in, in relation to asylum seekers. You always, is it possible for us to get any worse? And then we do. And the so you know people who are supposedly smaller liberals are, are more conservative than than any conservative leaders of the past. What, yes. So so the question is, what hope is there, and what can create change? I find I I struggle as a businessman to work out how it could possibly happen. So what's the way forward really in that? Of this? I think a quick question here, and one over there, and then I think we'll ask the panel to wrap up because I know it's. So we do try to finish these things on time. Question Sorry, excuse me. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Chandran, and uh, I'd say I'm just an ordinary Australian. I, I think that's all right. Uh, my question to you is, you have explained wonderfully the past 30 years. Can you uh, share your thoughts with us as how the commission would be in 30 years from now, in 2046, uh, would it be uh, strengthened, uh, notwithstanding all the pressures that we the Commission faces from the media, uh, ever more so now every day, and also the government? Would they be as satisfied as, as we are now, or would they have more things to complain? Your thoughts, please. Thank you. Oh, it doesn't actually. Could you? Um, uh, could you do lower? Uh, 
Thank you, Lyon. I'm from the New South Wales Anti-Discrimination Board. I just wanted to touch on something that you said, Rosemary, in relation to the problem with the individual nature of the complaint system and, and really ask the panel what you think the solution to that is. And, and I guess it ties in with this gentleman's question about the future and, and how we move forward from, from that limitation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now let's uh, wrap up uh, a response from each of the members. Thanks. The last question, Rosemary, I'll leave to you since it was directed to you. <laughs> uh, and, and I'll just touch only very, very briefly. Um, where will the Commission be in 30 years' time? Um, I, I think um, even stronger and more effective than it is now. Just like as now, I, I don't think the Commission has ever been more effective than it is at the moment. Um, certainly it's stronger than it was 15 years ago, and that will continue. And its relationship with the government, probably pretty much the same. Um, Neville, yes, yeah, yeah, we, we, we've, we've got to find the hope. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm a, a, I'm a long-term optimist, but a short-term pessimist. Uh, I, I think things in some areas are going to get harder before they get easier. But you know, there is that support. You know, I refer to the national consultation results. There, there is support in the community for human rights work. We're just not mobilising it properly. Um, things are better in many areas than they were before, you know, even to the extent that we've got legislation now in most of these areas that uh, 40 years ago we didn't have. You know, I think that the, the kinds of things that Gillian said and Rosemary and Elizabeth point to achievements of the last 30 years, and they are very tangible. And uh, we, we can draw hope from the past, as not just not just lessons. But I'm 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 optimistic. I really am. Yes, despite all, there are and have been always steps forward. Sometimes quick and sometimes slow. So we just have to keep our hope up, keep talking about it, keep the community interested in the issues, resist attacks on human rights, just just keep, keep, keep the thing going, keep it going. And if we look to the future then, I can, I can predict what will be there in 30 years time because I won't be there, <laughs> I won't be there to see it. So we will have this marvellous charter of rights with the Human Rights Commission having the task of seeing that we, we all, uh, everything complies with it and conducting its inquiries into all the areas of problems and coming up with all the solutions and everything will be lovely. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to collapse my answer for all three of those into the, to the one answer and in 30 years' time I really... I'm not going to be as ambitious as saying that we'll have a constitutional based Bill of Rights, but I really would like to see a statutory Bill of Rights. I'd like to see us have something that gives the judiciary the framework to say that human rights matter in Australia and that we will apply human rights in our broad and purposive interpretation of the mechanisms um, around not just discrimination law, but all law. If we look at some of the, the emerging evidence that we're getting from mainly Victoria, there hasn't been a lot of case law coming out of the ACT, but I urge anybody that's interested in the area of disability and the use of a human right, a statutory human rights, um, look at the case of Slattery. Slattery is a, a, a problematic man that's trying to engage his civic duty with the local council and they were exasperated and frustrated and didn't know how to, to work with him. And so they banned him from every single council site, meaning that he couldn't go to the pool with his grandchildren, couldn't go to the library, couldn't, you know, engage in his local community. And the um, VCAT decision was that that was an abuse of his right to participate in his community. And so I think there are glimmers on the horizon that if we take small steps, we might be able to break through. It looks really dark at the moment. This week was a really low point. Um, but a bit like Chris, I really am a short-term pessimist, but I am a long-term optimist. I can't see it being a part, of, a part of a constitution, but I think in 30 years, we can have a statutory bill of rights. 
Well, thank you very much indeed uh, for, for, your, for the wisdom and the optimism that you bring. And perhaps I can finish by saying that, that I too am optimistic. I think many of the, we've had a bad week, um, but I also believe that many of these policies are rejected by Australians. It's un-Australian, some of this language and discussion. I, we will get past this, I'm absolutely certain we will. And one of the rather curious things is that we're seeing leadership coming from the States. And you will know that this week, um, uh, Premier um, Palaszczuk has uh, advised that they will be looking at a Charter of Rights in Queensland. I never thought I would live to see the day, and here we are. So maybe from the experience of Victoria and the case law and the relative stability in that uh, jurisdiction for human rights, the ACT, now some possibilities in Queensland, maybe we can build through education the political will to translate what Chris has said exists in the public environment but has not been translated into, the, uh, into political action. And perhaps in the end, that's where we have to go. So thank you all so much for coming tonight. Please do join us for the second Rights Talk, but mainly thank our wonderful speakers. And, and please do sign up. Um, please do join us if you can. I know it costs, but please try to join us for the Human Rights Awards. I think Quentin's going to be absolutely marvellous. She's got a few stories to tell as well. Thanks very much. <laughs>